right, so last time we uh, finished uh, chapter 14, and so now we uh, move into uh, chapter 15, and um, we're getting ready. Uh, chapter 15 really is setting the stage for chapter 16, and chapter 16 is going to be a pretty important chapter because it's going to be uh, the vials. Now, of course, the uh, the new translations say bowls, and so you, you may, some of you may be more familiar with the seven bowls. Uh, in the King James, it's the seven vials. And so these are going to be the last seven judgments um, of the, the book of Revelation as far as the tribulation is concerned. Now, if you remember, um, the book of Revelation takes you through the tribulation four times. Um, one of the mistakes that expositor, uh, expositors and commentators make is they want to take uh, Revelation as being a chronological book. Um, they want to say, first you've got the seals, then you've got the trumpets, uh, then you've got uh, the vials, you know, and, and so the, these things build upon one another. I don't believe that's the case at all. Um, I believe that uh, what you have is Revelation is giving you four different views of the second coming of Christ. Now, if you remember, uh, the first coming of Christ, we have four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And John. And these four Gospels combine to give you one complete view of the first advent of Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. Alright? Now in Revelation, you've got the same thing going on. But instead of separate books, what you have is the seal judgments. Then you have the trumpet judgments. Then you have uh, the, the uh, chapters that deal with the Antichrist. And then last of all, you have the vials. And so these give you four different views of the second advent of Jesus Christ. So chapter 15 today is what we call a parenthetical to some degree. In other words, it's like something that's inserted, that's not really part of the narrative, but it helps prepare what's about to come next as far as chapter uh, 16. Because in chapter 16, that's where we will come across these uh, seven vials. And so it says in verse 1, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And so these seven last plagues, we'll discuss them in detail when we get to chapter 16. Now, uh, notice uh, that the book of Revelation frequently reminds us about the wrath of God. It says, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. All right, now the wrath of God is a subject that nobody wants to talk about. And so for that reason, Revelation uh, has always been uh, looked at skeptically. It's always been uh, ridiculed. And a lot of people just don't read it. Uh, some people uh, don't read it because they say they can't understand it. Other people uh, say that uh, uh, it, it just uh, it, it can't be true, uh, that, that it's all metaphors and, and, and things like that. So people have their different reasons. Um, I remember several years ago, uh, this would have been around probably 2001, 2002, somewhere in that time frame. Um, I was listening uh, uh, to Rush Limbaugh on the radio uh, in my office. Uh, at the time, I was the uh, uh, regional director for urgent care chain in Arizona. And uh, I always had Rush playing uh, on uh, the radio in the background. And uh, so some caller called in and started talking about the rapture and asking Rush what he thought about the rapture. And... Uh, he brought up uh, uh, the book of Revelation. And when he brought up the book of Revelation, Rush Limbaugh just snapped. I, I, I've never seen anything like it. And just went on a tirade rebuking this guy up one side and down the other. He said the book of Revelation is a book of, it, it's trash, it's garbage, it doesn't even belong in the Bible. Why are you reading that mess? And of course, you know, Rush Limbaugh is a, a very well noted you know, conservative, you know, or he was before he passed away. And so, uh, at any rate, uh, I looked at the doctor I was working for, David Smock. I said, you mark, mark my words, God's going to judge that man. Because he just told several million people that the book of Revelation is trash and garbage. And the Bible says, blessed is the one that reads or hears the words of this testimony. Listen, I'm telling you the truth. If I'm lying, I'm dying. About three or four months later, Rush Limbaugh went completely deaf. Now think about this, you're a radio guy, and you go completely deaf. I am convinced that was the judgment of God on Rush Limbaugh. And um, he got a cochlear implant, and so that restored about, I think, 30 or 40% of his hearing. And so he was able to carry on with his career. Now, 
later in his life before he died, it's been well reported that he came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, especially after he got cancer. I think it was lung cancer that he got. Yep. And so, uh, at any rate, uh, I believe that Rush was a saved man when he left this world, and praise God for that. But I believe that God humbled him. Because, listen, when you're a radio guy, you're hearing, if you can't hear your own voice as you're like, uh, you know, listening to the headphones and all that stuff going out over the airways, uh, your career is done. And so it's a miracle that he was able to continue with the cochlear implant. But nevertheless, uh, a lot of people have that attitude about the book of Revelation. And I think that one of the reasons is, is because the book of Revelation reminds us of the wrath of God, and this world does not want to hear about the wrath of God. This world wants to hear about the love of God. So, so would you say, because reading the whole Bible, in the Old Testament, I kept reading about disobedience, 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 yes. and consequences. So on a scale, wrath and love, with the wrath... God's a balanced being. And, 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 and so there, there's no such thing as... You know, uh, wrath and, and love. It's it's wrath and love. You know, God is a balanced being. He's not like us, and so uh, that's a, a reason why some people don't like the Old Testament, though, right. because the Old Testament really uh, projects the holiness of God and the judgment that comes as a result of disobedience. You know, see, people. You know, one of Eric's favorite terms here is the rescuing love of Jesus. Okay, people are fine if you're talking about the rescuing love of Jesus. They are not fine if you talk about the consequences of rejecting the rescuing love of Jesus. And so uh, Revelation is, is, is a despised book, uh, I, I believe primarily, uh, because it deals with the wrath and judgment of God. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, some scholars don't even believe uh, that uh, the book of Revelation should be in the Bible. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the Greek manuscripts... Uh, that many of the new versions are based on. Well, one of the primary ma uh, manuscripts is called Vaticanus. Vaticanus, where do you think that came from? Oh, well, I don't know, maybe the Vatican? <laughs> Give yourself a star. <laughs> All right, uh, Vaticanus, uh, from the book of Hebrews on, doesn't have any of the Bible. And so um, one of the chief source manuscripts that the new versions are based on doesn't even have Hebrews to Revelation. And so they have to go get that from other manuscripts. And so uh, somebody despised Revelation so much that they didn't even think that it belonged in the New Testament, right? And so uh, uh, here, once again, though, we're, we're reminded of the wrath of God. Now, I have a little bit more to say about that uh, towards the end of the chapter. All right, so uh, verse 2, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hearts of God. Now notice this uh, sea of glass mingled with fire. Now we saw this back in uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4. Let's come back to chapter 4 for a second. I just realized I'm not wearing my glasses. I hope I'll be able to read this Bible. <laughs> is that there sitting right there? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm going to have a real challenge with this. <laughs> How y'all like my new spectacles, by the way? Uh, I got bifocals without the line. <laughs> and, and so now I don't look as old. <laughs> All right, so uh, Revelation chapter 4. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, of course, this is when John is caught up to the third heaven. And uh, look at um, verse uh, 5. And out of the throne, this is talking about the throne of God, uh, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now watch verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne, around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And so that's where this uh, uh, sea of glass uh, shows up uh, for the first time. And the sea of glass uh, is uh, before the throne of God. Now, um, I believe this sea of glass is uh, spoken about in the book of Job. Come over to the book of Job for a moment and look at Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Of course, Job is right before Psalms, and so find Psalms and go back a few pages. Job 38, and uh, come to verse 30. Uh, it says, verse 30, uh, The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep, is frozen 
Now look at verse 31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? All right, anybody know what Pleiades or, or Orion is in reference to? Stars. The stars, as far as the star clusters. You know, uh, you, know you get to see uh, like the, the zodiac signs in, you know, in the stars. And so these are a cluster of stars, Pleiades uh, and Orion. And so uh, notice that the deep, uh, when we think of the deep, what do we think of? We think of the ocean, mm -hmm. the sea, right? We think of the, you know, the deep. In the Bible, though, the great deep is a reference to a body of water that's above this universe. And Job says that the deep, the face of the deep, is frozen. Now, do you know anywhere where uh, the ocean is frozen? I mean, the, the, the sodium concentrate in, in, in ocean water would preclude it being able to freeze. Now, of course, you know, in the polar ice caps with the extreme temperatures there, you've got icebergs and things like that. But um, the face of the deep is frozen. And so ice, when it's frozen, what's it resemble? Glass. Crystal. Glass. Glass. And so what I think you have going on here is this. Let me use blue for the earth, all right? So you got three heavens. The first heaven is the atmosphere of the earth. This is where the birds fly. This is where you see the clouds. And so that's the atmosphere. The second heaven, I guess I should use. I got a need. Oh, sorry. Thank you. You could put the L on vials, too. <laughs> hey, you guys know the spelling is not that <laughs> one You guys know I can't spell to save my life. <laughs> yeah, I forgot the L, didn't I? <laughs> oh, well. Y'all get the picture. We got it. All right. So the second heaven is the solar system or the universe. And that's where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. And then you got the third heaven, and that's the dwelling place of God. There's his throne, and that's the heaven of heavens right there. All right, now Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he was caught up to the third heaven. So that's how we know there's three of them. All right, if you look in Genesis chapter 1, you'll find three of them. If you look in Psalm 145, you'll find or 148 rather, no it is 145, you'll find three of them. And so uh, there are three heavens, and there's this sea of glass before the throne of God, and I believe that this sea of glass is the great, uh, is the face of the great deep, and it's the face of the deep is frozen, and it's what separates the third heaven from the rest of the universe and the rest of God's creation. And so uh, when he talks about this sea of glass, uh, one place he says mingled with fire, mingled with fire. Well, you know, uh, that, that's the result of the reflection of all these different colored gems reflecting off the, the surface uh, of that ice or the, fur, uh, the surface of that deep. Yes, Becky, you had a question? Is that probably why everybody argues that, well, we've been up in outer space and we have not found heaven? Um, heaven is supposed to be, I, I, that's just an argument. Well, we, we, we haven't gone very far into space, but I, I tell you one thing that it does uh, 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 settle, you know, uh, 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 you know, NASA wants to say, oh, we found water in space. Well, your Bible told you that thousands of years ago, <laughs> that there's water in space, if you just believe what God said. And so uh, this uh, sea of glass, uh, it's, uh, you know, mingled with fire. And that's just a reflection of the stones upon uh, on the surface. And it says that them that have gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And so obviously, um, a post-tribulation rapture has taken place that has allowed these tribulation saints who overcame him, overcame the Antichrist, to now be in heaven with the Lord, because it says that they uh, had gotten the victory over the beast, that's the Antichrist, 
over his image, that's the statue that he commands people to worship, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, 666. And they sit on the glass, and they have the hearts of God. And so um, we talk about two raptures. There's the pre-tribulation rapture of the church that takes place before the tribulation begins. That's for you and I. But then there is a post-tribulation rapture of tribulation saints where they are caught out of here uh, before uh, the Lord comes back with all his fury. Now it says in verse 3, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. Now notice uh, the uh, mention of Moses uh, once again. And so uh, uh, this uh, song of Moses, it can be one of two things. It can be uh, uh, Exodus chapter 15, which is the song that the Israel sang uh, after Pharaoh and his armies were drowned in the Red Sea. Uh, or it could be Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, when uh, the Israelites are about to go into the promised land that God has, has given to them. And so um, I think it could be either or. Um, both of these chapters are rather long chapters, so I'm going to, for sake of time, kind of let you read those on your own, and it's in your study notes there. Uh, but Exodus chapter 15 is a song, and uh, Exodus chapter 32 is a song, and either one of these could be the song of Moses. But I want you to notice the reappearance of Moses again. Because we spent a lot of time talking about this in chapter 14. Because um, with Moses, we think of the law. Remember John 1, 17? For the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So when we think Moses, we think law. When we think Jesus, we think grace. So Moses is associated with the law. And so they sing the song of Moses. Why? Well, because Moses is one of the two witnesses, as we've already established back in chapter 11. Moses is going to come back in the tribulation. He's going to be one of those two witnesses that opposes the Antichrist. Um, last week, we looked at a few verses. Let's uh, just, uh, for the sake of uh, time, just uh, uh, glance at them again. Come over to uh, Revelation 12, 17. Let me ask you a question. The, one, the, the people that were victorious over the beast and all, is that the 144, or is that the ones that the 144 witness to? I think it's probably a, 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 a combination of both, Linda. I, I can't say for sure, but that's a great question. Um, it's definitely one or the other. And if, it, if it's one or the other, we don't know which because the text doesn't say. I tend to think it's the combination of both. It's the 144,000 gathered together with the people that they want to Christ that the Lord has now raptured to heaven okay. and they're able to sing in celebration as far as the victory that they've gotten over the Antichrist. Okay. But, um, you know, uh, the, the text doesn't spell that out specifically and so, uh, you know, I, I'm just giving you okay. my thought on it, you know, which may or may not be uh, entirely correct. Okay. After all, I am from West Virginia. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Revelation uh, chapter 12, verse 17. Um, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And so we established that the woman is Israel and uh, the remnant of her seed is, uh, is the remnant of Israel, which keep the commandments of God, comma, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right, so they keep the commandments of God, comma, and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So notice there's a distinction between the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, the commandments of God, what is that? Well, it's the law. The commandment of God, there's uh, 613 mitzvahs, as they call them, in the Old Testament. Um, and, of course, you know, it's pretty much summed up in the Ten Commandments. Uh, but the law is full of commandments. Now, you're in uh, chapter 12, verse 17. Look at 14, uh, uh, 12. 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God comma, and have the faith of Jesus. So once again, the commandments of God are differentiated between the faith of Jesus, and the commandments of God are associated with the law. And then one more, Revelation 22, uh, verse uh, 14. Revelation 22, verse 14. And 22, 14, blessed are they that do his commandments. Now, some translations will say, blessed are they that wash their robes. 
Uh, but in King James it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates uh, into the city. And so notice the emphasis, uh, once again, is on doing commandments. What are the commandments, once again? The law. And so in the tribulation, and even in the millennium, the law has returned. And it's not simply salvation by grace through faith alone. There is an element of works involved because of the law. Notice in verse 14 it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right, right, they've earned it, they've earned the right to the tree of life. So do we make a distinction between Old Testament saints and New Testament saints? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, people want to say that, uh, that uh, Old Testament saints were saved the same way New Testament saints are. That's impossible. Uh, New Testament saints are born again. Nobody in the Old Testament was born again. Uh, New Testament saints are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, the circumcision of the heart. Nobody in the Old Testament received the circumcision made without hands. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, we're sealed by the Spirit of God to the day of redemption. Nobody in the Old Testament was sealed by the Spirit of God. Saul got the Holy Spirit and lost the Holy Spirit. Never got him back. Uh, Saul, or, 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 or Samson uh, had the Holy Spirit, lost the Holy Spirit, and got him back before he died. David, after his sin with Bathsheba, seeing what had happened to Saul, and he didn't want to end up like Saul, in Psalm 51, he's begging God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And so uh, th that's not New Testament salvation. And so, uh, and, 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 and to top it off, um, Old Testament saints didn't even go to the same place that New Testament saints go when we die. Uh, when you and I die, where do we go? Heaven. Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, in the Old Testament, when, when Old Testament saints died, they went to paradise or Abraham's bosom in the heart of this earth. And when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the Bible says that he led captivity captive. Uh, he took those Old Testament saints that were captive in the heart of the earth, and he took them to heaven so that paradise now is in the third heaven because Paul says that he was caught up to the third heaven to paradise. So, so taking it even a little bit further then, because we, we are saying now there is a distinction. Yes. But as a, saved, as a saint in the New Testament better than the saint in the Old Testament, or are they equal? No. There's a distinction between them, but they're equal. Yeah, we're all equal in Christ. Right. There, there, there's whether no, in the Old Testament or New Testament. There's no superiority between right. whether uh, an Old right. Testament saint or the New Testament saint. Right. Because ultimately, we're all saved by the blood of the Lamb. You know, even the Old Testament saints, their sins are paid for by the blood of the Lamb. But there were requirements that were placed on them that are not placed on us. You and I don't have to make sacrifices. We don't have to go to a temple. Uh, you know, uh, we don't have to uh, do uh, all the ceremonial aspects of the law, observing the Sabbath and all these uh, different things, the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Tabernacles and, and all that type of stuff. That, that's not for us because we're Gentiles. And so, uh, but that doesn't make us any better than them. Uh, if any, if there was going to be a superiority, they were the chosen of God before we ever existed. The superiority would lie on them. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we're all, all one and we're all equal, uh, you know, in Christ Jesus. But there's different distinctions. For example, as New Testament saints, you and I, we're the bride of Christ. We're his bride. The Old Testament uh, saints, they're not his bride, you know. And so uh, yeah, there, there are distinctions, but, it, you know, just kind of like uh, 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 husbands and wives. There are distinctions as far as roles, as far as what God intends for, for husbands and wives, as far as roles and responsibilities. That doesn't make one better than the other, though. Uh, we're all equal together in Christ. Uh, God doesn't look at me as being superior to Amy, and he doesn't look at Amy as being superior to me. We're, we're one, uh, uh, one flesh. God's got roles and responsibilities for me as a husband. He's got roles and responsibilities for her as a wife. And as long as we stay within those roles and responsibilities, then God blesses me. And so, uh, but one of us is not better than the other. So it is with the body of Christ as far as the New Testament and then the Old Testament saints, tribulation saints, millennial saints, and, and, and all of that. So, um, and so we see this uh, uh, association of the law. Let me give you one more. And I've given these to you before, but, uh, but some of you haven't uh, 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 maybe seen all the videos, uh, and so I won't take anything for granted because uh, we've been doing a lot of stuff by Zoom for so long. 
Um, look at uh, Malachi. Come to, to Matthew. Malachi is the book right before Matthew. And come to Malachi chapter 4, uh, the last chapter of the Old Testament. We'll take a look at this and then we'll move on. Hi, how are you? Good, good to see you. Good to see you. You too, John. Take care. You're welcome. You too. Thanks. That was Miss Janet. I know she was looking for you and you know, before you got here. Oh, okay. To say that. Yeah. We, uh, I, I sent her the uh, the video link each week, so she she's able to keep up with us and all our shenanigans. <laughs> all right, Malachi chapter 4. Now, uh, as I said before, the context of this, when you look at it, it's the second coming of Christ, and, 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 and you couldn't miss this if you were blind and deaf. It says, uh, For behold, the day cometh, the day, that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Now you couldn't miss that the second coming of Christ unless you wanted to. Son of righteousness. Notice son is spelled S-U-N, but it's given a capital S so that you know it's talking about Jesus. And this is just showing you that the son is a type of Christ. The son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. And so verses 1 through 3 is talking about the day of the Lord, the literal second advent of Jesus Christ, Jesus physically and literally and visibly coming back to the earth and destroying the wicked as he returns. Now watch verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses. Now, why in the world would I want to remember the law of Moses in a tribulation context? Because the law of Moses comes back in the tribulation, and that's why they're keeping the commandments of God. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in order for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Now watch verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Elijah the prophet? Ah, I see. Who are the two witnesses again? Elijah. And who shows up together in Malachi chapter 4? Elijah. I mean, come on now, folks. I mean, um, I don't know how it was at your high school, but at Huntington High School in 1987, when I graduated, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now, I know with this modern math and all, all this crazy, what do they call this new education? Um, Stupid. <laughs> it's stupid, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we should call it, Barbara. <laughs> Isn't it funny that the quietest person in the room always comes up with the funniest stuff? <laughs> yeah. so, oh, a uh, common core. Common core. If John was here, he would have been able to tell me. Uh, you know, they, they talk about this common core, you know, and all this stuff. Well, you know, in the day and time we live in, two plus two can equal five. If that's what little Johnny wants it to be. Because after all, little Johnny has a right to speak his truth, just like little Sally has the right to speak her truth, so we shouldn't be dogmatic that two plus two is four. <laughs> you know, it's whatever you feel it is, honey. Uh, no, it is what it is. It is kind of stupid. Yeah, re re regardless of how you feel about it, it is what it is. And so, uh, in Revelation chapter 11, does it point blank say that it's Moses and Elijah? No, it does not. But when you read the signs and wonders that those two are performing, and see how they match the lives of Moses and Elijah as far as what they did. You go to Matthew 17 and see Moses and Elijah <laughs> together on the Mount of Transfiguration. You come to Malachi 4 and you see Moses and Elijah mentioned together in the context of the second advent. Look, folks, 2 plus 2 is 4. Take off the blinders and just accept what the Bible is showing you. And some people, you know, want to, you know, this, you know, I, I still don't want to go, okay, well, if you don't, that's fine. I don't have any problem with it. <laughs> All right, uh, Revelation uh, uh, 15. Revelation 15. All right, now it says, uh, verse uh, 3, uh, 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 it says they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And so notice the Lamb is capitalized. That's talking about Jesus. Saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. All right? Now notice two things there. He's called Lord God Almighty, and then he's called King of Saints. Both of those titles emphasize his deity, the fact that Jesus is God as well as man. Um, look back at Revelation chapter 1. 
Revelation chapter 1. We covered this all the way at the beginning. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 8. Here Jesus says, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega, the last letter of the Greek alphabet. So basically, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. Uh, and so he says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, ending, saith the Lord, which is, present tense, which was, past tense, and which is to come, future tense. I am, I always have been, I always shall be. Jehovah, <laughs> I am. And then look at this, the Almighty. And so Jesus claims the title of the Almighty for himself. Now, a Jehovah Witness may not get that, a Mormon may not get that, but a Bible believer ought to get that. Jesus is claiming that he is God. That's why the disciples worshipped him as God. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. You know, of Jesus, Paul said that God was manifest in the flesh. And so the disciples worshipped him as God. Uh, the angels worshipped him as God. Uh, listen, the demons worshipped him as God because they knew who he was, the Holy One of Israel. And then most importantly, uh, God, the Father, calls him God. Because in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, God the Father says to God the Son, Thy throne, O God, is an everlasting throne. And so um, if God the Father calls you God, then you're probably God. God. <laughs> because God cannot lie. And so, uh, you know, of course the Trinity, you know, it's one of those things, you know, and some people don't even like the term because it's not a Bible term. Uh, but the triune God, as far as the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, um, they are three persons in one being, and you'll never understand that. You'll never explain that. Don't try to use the hard-boiled egg uh, example because that's fallible. Don't try to use the ice example because that's fallible. One of the things that makes it hard to understand is there, is there are no illustrations that we can look at uh, humanly or physically that accurately represent the trinity of the Godhead 100%. Because when we talk about that, one plus one plus one is one. It ain't three. Right. But watch, <laughs> but watch this. Two and two is four. But no. one plus one plus one is one. But, but here's the thing. <laughs> your math is, your, your equation's <laughs> off. Oh, I see. I, I wasn't too good at math. I have to admit. Are you saying you were dumb as bricks? Dumb as bricks. <laughs> dumb as bricks. All right. All right, let's look at this. One plus one plus one. Now, ordinarily, we would say that's three, three. right? <laughs> right. I mean, that's just kind of common sense, even for Paul Baker. Right, right, right. <laughs> but watch this. <laughs> that's a who. That's a who. And that's a who. <laughs> and those three who's make a who. who. <laughs> A one who, what? So God is three who's and one what? Because those three who's, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, combine to make one God as far as essence and being. And so they all have their different roles and responsibilities. Uh, they all have uh, uh, their uh, uh, own unique uh, you know, characteristics. Of course, Jesus is... Uh, is uh, the, the, the manifestation of the Godhead bodily, you know, as far as uh, the person of God that you can see and so forth. Um, but there's still uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so, but it's all one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, one Lord. He's one. That's, you know, the, the Jews call that the Shema, you know. And so, uh, you know, it's difficult to comprehend. It's diff uh, difficult to uh, explain. But at some point, we just have to believe what the Bible says, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, someday in heaven, you know, we may have a more perfect, uh, you know, understanding. But uh, the second title, Kings, uh, you know, I won't turn there for sake of time, but of course, in Revelation 19, uh, he's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so, uh, here in uh, verse three, he is the Lord God Almighty, and he's also the King of Saints. And so, both of those titles are titles for Jesus, and both of them. Uh, are uh, uh, associated with this deity. All right. Uh, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, 
For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Now, we see verse 4 literally fulfilled in the book of Zechariah. Um, it says, uh, all nations shall come and worship before thee. And so uh, come back to uh, Zechariah in the Old Testament. And so you got Matthew, and before Matthew is Malachi, and before Malachi is Zechariah. And so come to Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, in the first part of the chapter, you have uh, the literal second advent of Jesus Christ. And so for a second time, we won't read that, but we've read this chapter many times before. This is where Jesus, uh, in verse 3, physically comes back and plants his feet on the Mount of Olives, and the mountain splits in two. And so uh, Jesus left from the Mount of Olives. Jesus will come back to the Mount of Olives. And so uh, but look down at verse 16, because this is after Christ has come back. It says, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles. Now, they're going up to worship Him on the Feast of Tabernacles. Hmm. You know what the Feast of Tabernacles is? September, October. You know, the Jewish calendar is slightly different than ours, so sometimes the Feast of Tabernacles will fall at the end of September, and sometimes it will fall in early uh, October. And the difference is we have a uh, solar calendar, they have a lunar calendar. All of the Jewish months have an equal number of 30 days. We have some that have, you know, uh, 31 days, February has 28 days. The Jews have 30 days straight across, and so uh, they go by a lunar calendar. And so that's why there's a fluctuation as far as when the Passover takes place and when the Feast of Tabernacles takes place. So Feast of Tabernacles, though, is in the fall, end of September, early October. Now, I know we all, uh, you know, uh, have been uh, uh, taught to celebrate the birth of Christ in December, right? That's impossible that he was born in December. It, 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 there's not even a debate about it that he was not born in December. Uh, now, down through the centuries, you know, uh, the Catholic Church kind of, uh, you know, came up with this Christmas, Christ, Mass. What's a Mass? Uh, it's a Catholic thing, right? So Christ, Mass, they eventually dropped the S off, uh, uh, the second S off. But Christ Mass comes more from Catholic tradition. And it was associated uh, with the winter solstice. But here's the thing. Think about this. We know from Scripture that Jesus was 33 and a half years old. Right? If you count back six months from the Passover, that does not put you in December. If the Passover is, you know, uh, March, April, and it is, and again it varies because of the difference of the Jewish calendar. If you count back six months from March, April, well, let's do it. Let's start April and go, go to March, that's one month, to February, two months, to January, three months, uh, to December, four months, to November, five months, to October, six months. All right, so if you count back six months from March, April, you find yourself not in December, but in September, October. And so when was Jesus born? Most likely, he was born in the end of September, early October, at the Feast of Tabernacles because it was God coming down to tabernacle in the flesh, God with us. As far as December is concerned, if, if Mary had a normal nine-month pregnancy, guess what she would have conceived in December? <laughs> so, so we got a little backwards. Jesus was quite likely conceived in December, but he was born at the Feast of Tabernacles in September, October, and in the millennium, when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom, because that's what's happening here in Zechariah 14, the second advent's over, Christ is back. And now every year, all the nations of the earth, they have to come up and worship the king in Jerusalem. And when are they doing it? The Feast of Tabernacles. Happy birthday, Jesus. <laughs> Here's your gift for this year. Please give our land water. Look what it says. Verse 17. And it uh, shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be what? No rain. No rain. All right? No worship, no birthday present, no rain. Simple as that. And so uh, everybody uh, you know, uh, wants to wish Jesus a happy birthday. Well, that's great, but we're doing it at the wrong time of year. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you think about it. In December, Israel's in the northern hemisphere. 
just like we are. So they have winter at the same time we do. Shepherds don't abide with their flocks in December in the land of Palestine. Too cold. And so, but the Bible tells us very clearly that when Jesus was born, that the shepherds were abiding in the fields with their flocks. Couldn't happen in December. Just couldn't. Now, I realize that this overturns everybody's apple cars because all of us have been raised our entire lives. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yeah, I need to be up uh, there on the praise team on stage. God help us if that happens. God help us if that happens. But I realize that goes against everything you may have been taught. But nevertheless, let God be true and every man a liar. Now, does that mean that you're some uh, you know uh, uh, evil pagan, you know, whatever, because you celebrate Christmas in December. No, not at all. Now, I, I, I've got some friends and some preachers that are so extreme on this issue that they would say, oh, yeah, you're just a bunch of pagans. Well, whatever, you know. Uh, what I found about Christmas is this. It's one of the best times of the year to hand out gospel tracts and witness to people about the Lord because since the holiday is associated with the birth of Christ, there's something about the month of December that people are just more open for the gospel than they are any other time of year. And so uh, even more so than Easter, because, you know, Easter in the world is not really as big a holiday as Christmas. Now, to us as Christians, Easter is like, you know, that's the, that's the bomb right there because that's the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. But as far as, uh, uh, you know, Christmas and Easter, the world has more of an affinity for, uh, for Christmas than they do Easter. And so I find it a good opportunity uh, to, uh, you know, uh, witness and hand out tracts and things like that. So, um, uh, no, I don't think you're, uh, you're an evil, wicked uh, pagan, you know, if you celebrate Christmas. Because uh, if you come to my house, you'll find a Christmas tree, too, you know, because Lydia likes the lights. And I'll do anything for Oh, it's Lydia's fault. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm going to play with Lydia. Lord, I would have got rid of that tree, but it was for Lydia. <laughs> All right. So, uh, verse uh, 5. And after that, I looked, and behold, the temple, the tabernacle, the testimony in heaven uh, was opened. Uh, notice that the true tabernacle is in heaven. And so, uh, you know, the, the tabernacle that, that Moses made, uh, you know, on the earth, uh, it was made from a pattern of that of which is in heaven. And, uh, you know, the one on earth <clears throat> was a shadow or a type of the true tabernacle, which is in heaven. Uh, now in the notes there, uh, I put uh, a reference to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Obviously, that's a rather long chapter, so I'm going to let you read that uh, on your own time. Uh, for sake of time. All right, verse 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden plates. Uh, notice the pure and white linen. And so uh, uh, white is a symbol of purity. And I put a reference here for... Um, uh, Isaiah 118, uh, come let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, uh, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, right? And so uh, some people try to attach uh, racial connotations to that, that when you say white is the color of purity, oh, you're talking about white supremacy. No, I'm not. Uh, white is just the, the, the color of purity in the Bible, even as red or crimson is the color of sin. You know, we say, you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, that's black as sin. Black is not the color of sin in the Bible. Black is the color of judgment. In the Bible, crimson or red is the color of sin. Because, uh, again, Isaiah says, Though your sins be red like crimson, they shall be as white as snow. And so when it talks about the pure and white linen, it's just talking about something that's undefiled. You ever <laughs> seen like a, like, a, you know, a, like a bride at a wedding with that pretty white dress? I mean, it's, uh, you know... You can't find anything more white and more pure than a, than a bride's wedding dress, right? That's why after a wedding, most brides have, their, they go to the dry cleaners, they put their uh, uh, dress, they get it sealed, like an airtight type thing to uh, preserve it over time so that it doesn't fade and yellow, uh, you know, over time. And so uh, it just has to do with, without spot, without blemish. I mean, a bride's worst nightmare would be, uh, you know, spilling wine or, or some, you know, uh, 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 dark colored thing on her dress and staining her dress, right? And so uh, these are clothed in pure and white linen uh, in, in, in the sense of, uh, you know, just the purity, it's undefiled. Uh, verse 7, 
And one of the four beasts uh, gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. All right, these are the same four beasts that were uh, found back in chapter 4 and chapter 5. Uh, you know, uh, one has a face like a lion, one has a face like a, uh, an ox, one has a face like a man, one has a face like an eagle. Uh, these are the seraphim of, uh, of uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6. And so uh, we won't uh, uh, spend much time on that. I, I, if you can't tell, I'm trying to rush and finish it. All right, so uh, uh, verse 8, and the temple was filled. Well, actually, let me go back. Seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, full of the wrath of God. Uh, notice, uh, once again, we see the mention of the wrath of God. And I want you to remember that in Romans 5, 9, it says that God saved us from wrath. Um, in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, 1, 9, it says that God delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, 9, it says that God has not appointed us unto wrath, right? And then in Revelation 6, it says the great day of his wrath is come. So if you want to know why we're not here for the tribulation, as far as the church, it's because God delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, he has not appointed us to wrath. Uh, he saved us from wrath. And so uh, the scriptures could be any more clear when you compare scripture with scripture that we are not here for the tribulation because the tribulation is the wrath of God. And so in chapter 7, we'll find out more about these seven golden vials. And uh, we'll begin our fourth and final trip uh, through the tribulation. Verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And so uh, that closes out uh, chapter 8. Uh, the only way we made it through that chapter was because it was only eight verses. <laughs> if that had been a longer chapter, we probably would have been there a couple weeks. <laughs> All right. So uh, uh, at this time, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and sign off with our, uh, our Facebook Live broadcast. We uh, thank you for uh, those of you that have uh, tuned in. Uh, those on YouTube, you're welcome to stay with us. Uh, but we, uh, I mean, uh, Zoom rather. Uh, and those that are watching on YouTube, we thank you for your viewership as well. We pray the word of God has been a blessing, and we look forward to seeing you next time on our broadcast. May the Lord bless you.